Hello and welcome to this uh, lecture number six of the course Robot Motion Planning. In the, level, uh, in the last couple of classes, we have looked at the basic background review of uh, mobile robots and uh, serial arms, that is forward kinematics, inverse kinematics, transformations, to give you an idea of uh, how robots move and how do we analyze robotic systems. Okay. Now, using that knowledge, we'll move on uh, from today to the formal study of the course, Robot Motion Planning. So today, we'll start off with the first and the earliest algorithms, which are called the bug algorithms. Now, as the name suggests, bug algorithms means the, uh, the way bugs move around. Bugs means like ladybird, cockroach, you must have seen them moving around. So that is where the idea of bug, bug algorithms came from. And uh, uh, these are the earliest algorithms. Okay, so we study our formal, uh, we start the study of our formal course today after the revision. Today also I'll briefly, quickly review what we had done in the last couple of classes regarding forward kinematics, inverse kinematics, and then we'll move on to the earliest bug algorithms. Now, as the name indicates, bug algorithm, you can already see a bug uh, on the screen and it is showing that this is a ladybug and how the bug is moving from one point to another point. It has legs and it is moving forward in a straight line. Now, if there is an obstacle, the bug will avoid the obstacle and it will simply uh, go to the other side, avoiding the obstacle, right? So, the earliest bug algorithms were designed after looking at the way insects move in nature. Now, before we move on, let me very quickly go into forward and inverse kinematics. So in the last class, we looked at forward and inverse kinematics and we said that if we have a two link manipulator system like this, okay, this is two links for simplicity. This is my x axis, y axis and this is my point x, y. So in terms of the link lengths L1, L2 and the link variables theta1 and theta2, I can write this as uh, uh, x is equal to L1 cos theta1 plus L2 cos theta1 plus theta2 and y is equal to L1 uh, sin theta1 plus L2 sin theta1 plus theta2, okay. Now in forward kinematics, I am writing it in short by Fk, where we are given theta1, theta2, okay, say numerical value, some numerical value and we are asked to find what is xy, okay, this is my forward kinematics problem. Now, it's very simple because in these two equations, equation 1 and equation 2, we can simply put the values of cos theta here, cos theta 1 and theta 2, and we can get uh, what is the values of x and y, right? So, this is very, very simple. Whereas in inverse kinematics, that is ik, what we are uh, given is given xy of the end effector, find theta 1 and theta 2. Okay, this is a little bit more involved. Why? Because uh, you can see that the way this uh, terms appear, it is cos theta 1 plus theta 2. So, we cannot directly solve, okay. And also, there is the question of uh, multiple solutions, okay. So, there are multiple solutions which are possible. So, in the last class, we looked at the inverse kinematic solution of this two-link arm and uh, we found theta 1 and theta 2. So, squaring and adding, so squaring and adding equation 1 and 2, we basically got uh, cos theta 2 where theta 2 was equal to, so cos 2 was equal to x squared plus y squared minus L1 squared minus L2 squared divided by twice L1 L2, okay. And from cos theta 2, we got uh, sin theta 2 which is root, root 1 minus cos 2 squared and uh, then we use the etan function to get theta 2 was equal to etan uh, sin 2 and cos 2, this gave us the positive solution, okay. And once you get the positive solution, what is the other solution? So, it will become minus uh, theta 2 is one solution, the other solution and then you have to find what is theta 1 dashed, okay. And that we found geometrically by using geometry and uh, you can also find it by using algebraic method, but this is an easier method, geometrical methods are easier. So, this is my xy and this is my l1, l2. So, we have got theta 2, that means I have got this angle theta 2 and what I want to find is theta 1 now. So, geometrically we defined, uh, we completed this triangle. So, this triangle here like this and this triangle here. So, what we did is, uh, uh, what we did here is we defined an angle called alpha and we defined another small angle called beta, okay. So, what we found is that theta 1 is equal to alpha minus beta as shown in this figure, 
right? And then we found expression for uh, for a tan alpha. So tan alpha is equal to y by x, and uh, tan beta is equal to L two sine two divided by L one plus L two cos two. Okay. And then we use the formula tan alpha minus beta is equal to tan alpha minus tan beta divided by tan alpha plus tan beta. Okay, so this is what we did in the last class, and from here you can find taking tan inverse, you can find what is theta one. So once you find theta two and you find theta one, then the problem is solved. Okay, now we will be dealing only with two link systems here in our uh, course because it is simple. If you go higher than two links, it becomes more complicated. The, uh, the kinematics. So uh, this is just to understand the forward kinematics and inverse kinematics of this two link uh, manipulator system. Okay. So what is the problem here? Uh, what is the problem statement? The problem statement in motion planning would be that if you have an obstacle here like this, let's say there's an obstacle, green color obstacle, and you want to go from this point to this point. Okay. So this is my goal, and that is my uh, initial point. How many ways are there? And if there are large number of ways of going from this initial point to the goal point, then which path is going to give you the least energy path? Okay, least energy or least time or least distance, whichever way. Okay, so this is basically the path planning problem where you are given an obstacle and you have a robotic mechanism, either a serial link or a mobile robot, and uh, we are asked to find what is the the shortest path. Okay. Now, uh, so in order to find the energy, we looked at uh, the concept of Jacobian and singularity. Okay, and we said that uh, for this manipulator system, uh, I'll draw it very quickly here. For this very manipulator system that I just drew, x is equal to L1 cos theta 1 plus L2 cos theta 1 2 and y is equal to L1 sin 1 plus L2 sin 1 2. Right. This is the same figure that I drew some time back, L1, L2, this is theta 1, that's theta 2. Now, if I take the derivative of this, basically I want to find the relationship between the velocity at end effector and joint velocity. Okay, so I want to find the relationship between the end effector velocity and the joint velocity. Why? Because as far as the control system is considered, we are going to control the velocity of the end effector by controlling the joint velocity. Because at the mot there is a motor or an actuator at the joint, which we are controlling using the control system. Right? So we are more interested in looking at the velocity relationships. Plus, we are interested in the energy consumed. Now, you know that more the velocity, more will be the energy. So some, uh, this velocity and energy are related. Okay, that is also the reason why we need to look at the relationship of the velocities. So, in these two equations, we see that x and y is a function of theta 1 and theta 2. So, it means that I need to uh, find the derivative of this partial derivative with respect to theta 1, then with respect to theta 2. Okay. So, if I do that, I get dx is equal to uh, minus L1 sin 1 minus L2 sin 1 2 minus L2 sin 1 2 and dy is equal to L1 cos 1 plus L2 cos 1 2 plus L2 cos 1 2 and uh, if I write in matrix form, this is d theta 1, d theta 2, okay. Now uh, this is called the Jacobian and uh, in this particular case, it is a 2 by 2 uh, matrix and uh, we can write it in short at x dot is equal to j into theta dot, okay, where what is x dot? x dot is the end effector velocity. And this one is the joint velocity. Okay. Now it is. Uh, you would understand that this ma this mapping is not one is to one mapping. What I mean by that? Suppose I give. Uh, I want a uh, end effector velocity of one meter per second. It doesn't mean that I will need a joint velocity of one radian per second. It will. It's not one is to one. Okay. So what we are looking at is. Let, if I draw it this way. So this is my joint velocity, joint well velocity, and this is my end uh, effector velocity. There is some mapping which goes on. Okay, so we are interested in looking at this mapping, and this mapping is controlled by the Jacobian. Okay, so things like whether it is linear, whether it is non-linear, whether the mapping exists at all. For example, in a singularity, the mapping may not be there at all. Okay, so what we are interested in is trying to find the minimum energy. Okay, and we we saw that x dot is equal to j into theta dot, and what we are interested in is theta dot is equal to j inverse of x dot. Why? Because we are interested in controlling the uh, velocity of the joint. That's how we control the robot, right? 
so uh, what we see is theta dot is equal to adjoint of uh, j by determinant of j okay into x dot okay now this relationship shows us that if determinant of j is equal to 0 then uh, theta dot is equal to infinity okay so as the determinant of j is going towards infinity at uh, going towards 0 implies that theta dot is going towards infinity now going towards infinity means infinite energy which is obviously not possible okay so these points are called singularities so it serves two purposes number one is if you want to find the minimum energy requirement so minimum energy would mean maximize determinant of j directly right so that gives us uh, one way the other is minimum energy means stay far away uh, from singularity so the as the nearer you come to a singularity the more you'll have uh, your energy requirement will go up okay and finally it will go to energy uh, it will go to infinity okay so it serves these two answers of minimum energy that first you have to maximize determinant and then you can minimize the energy also by staying away from singularity so for example uh, i'm just giving an example if uh, there is a singularity let, let me take the example of this two link manipulator okay so these are small and so the work volume of this will be something like this okay this will fold this much and here so this is a boundary singularity this is a, uh, this is also a boundary singularity so if you are trying to go in a path like this which is coming very near the singularity okay that will consume more energy whereas if you take a path which is going far from the singularity away from the singularity somewhere here then that is going to take minimum energy it will take lesser energy we also found the uh, for a two link manipulator we also saw that minimum energy corresponds to theta 2 equal to 90 degrees and 270 degrees okay so if you plan when you're planning the motion we can make use of this uh, uh, business of minimum energy to find a path for which the energy consumption is going to be minimum okay so now let's proceed now with this background what we had done in the last class now as i said in the last class please uh, i'm doing it in very brief if you are interested in lo uh, looking at more details of this, please uh, refer to the Introduction to Robotics course in NPTEL or look at the textbook where they discuss kinematics and uh, forward kinematics, inverse kinematics, uh, then uh, manipulation ability, determinant of J in more detail. Okay, here we are doing just how much we need. Okay, so we are going to study about serial arm robots and it will be limited only mainly to two degree of freedom system at most three. Now the other kind of robots that we are going to look at are uh, mobile robots okay so mobile robots can be of differential drive type now a differential drive uh, robot is as shown here in figure a where there are uh, this is a uh, robot which has two wheels and there is no connection in the wheels yet so for example this connection is not there okay and each of the wheels is driven by a motor so motor here and motor here they independently driven okay now uh, we have a frame this is my frame this is the fixed frame or the reference frame this is my x that's my y okay now it is making this what we do is from the center point of the two wheels we have an x-axis so let's call it the 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 axis of the car the axis of the mobile robot and this is making an angle of theta to the x-axis this is my x okay so what we see here is that we can control this robot by looking at omega 1 omega 2 okay by controlling omega 1 and omega 2 we basically control the position of this one that is my x and y okay so x y and theta i need to control right so in order to control this basically i have to control i can uh, so so my control input input is my omega 1 omega 2 i have no other control input so with two control inputs i'm controlling three outputs now x y and theta okay so this is one type so let's call it type uh, sorry let's call it type 1 this is type b the same thing i'm going to put a reference frame here this is my x and that's my y now in this particular case uh, this is a differential drive but what you can see is that the wheels of the re the rear wheels are joined and they are driven by a drive it can be a motor it can be an engine so it has an angular velocity omega and there is a steering angle in front so this uh, 
we wheel in front can be steered so it is something like uh, the well, this is uh, the autos the auto the auto rickshaws that are uh, that you see on the roads okay so they have a they have a back uh, wheel drive and then there is a steering in the front okay so in this case also we have to fix our axis okay so this is my x axis and that's my y axis and uh, this is the coordinates x and y of the center of that point let's call it p and again we have uh, theta is the angle which you are making with the x axis so x y and theta okay are the outputs and the input is what there is a drive and there is a steering okay so let's call this omega and theta dot okay so we have a drive and a steering and both of this is controlling these three output x y and theta but the structure of the vehicle is different you can see that the rear wheels are both of them are driven and then there is a steering in front now in a car which is four wheeled which you can see here again uh, this is a car so the rear wheels are driven with a velocity omega and uh, there is a steering in front okay so this is the steering of the steering of the wheels so this one has a steering angle here that's my phi okay so how do we control the car we can control the speed of the car by changing omega and we can control the direction by changing phi and again at this point we have x and y and then we have uh, phi which is the steering angle so my input is omega and phi and my output is x y and theta okay so these are the different types of mobile robots that we look at as we uh, proceed now uh, so let us proceed from here now the earliest uh, bug algorithms uh, the idea for them were obtained from basically looking at insects like a motion of bugs and insects now what is a bug bug is an insect you know there are different kind of bugs there are beetles okay so there are beetles which look like this i'm sure you must have seen them okay they have wings also some of them like this then there's a ladybird as shown here okay then there's a cockroach the good old cockroach where you can see in your houses uh, or in other places okay where the cockroach has six legs this bug also shown here has six legs now if you observe this i'm sure you must have observed that the insect is going straight now suppose there is an obstacle here okay suppose there is an obstacle here okay what it will do is basically it after it hits the obstacle okay or even before it hits the obstacle it will try and bypass the obstacle like this and go from the other side so either it will go on the right side or it will go on the left side right now that is one so what we are seeing is that it has legs for motion that's how it is moving okay it has some sensors uh, for sensing obstacles okay obstacles food it has uh, sensors for that okay now in the case of uh, the ladybird that we are seeing that is moving here it has six legs and it uh, it can walk turn in the case of the cockroach uh, it also has six legs and it has these feelers okay these feelers are the sensors where it can touch something for example if there is an obstacle here let me draw it like this so if there's an obstacle here okay it can touch that and it can feel that okay something is there okay so this is basically the of the legs are for motion and the feelers are for sensing so what we are seeing that if you are going to design a mobile robot which can actually move around like an insect okay it must have some kind of motion capability so either it has legs or it has wheels okay insects don't have wheels they all have legs but mobile robots have wheels okay and there must be some kind of sensor for sensing the environment and if there is an obstacle it must sense and then there must be some kind of a plan okay plan or behavior okay of what uh, is the objective here so for example if this uh, is this uh, uh, ladybird wanted to go from here to here like that so it can bypass that and go there okay now if the cockroach is trying to avoid this obstacle it will touch the obstacle and it, it understands that the moment it has touched and then it can change its path okay, either that side or this side so what is the behavior the behavior is the change in uh, change in path okay now in order to do that uh, in order to have a particular behavior and to have a particular kind of plan then uh, it needs number one is some ways of moving legs or wheels and it has uh, it needs sensors also to sense uh, the environment right and then it can enforce a plan in this case the plan is very easy for the cockroach go left go right okay go left or go right it can do both okay. 
similarly for the ladybug a ladybug also it can go left or it can go right so we are in this path planning and motion planning course we are interested in finding the path in going from an initial point to a goal point maybe avoiding obstacles okay so uh, here the mobile robot will need some ways of moving forward and it will need some kind of sensor for sensing the environment and then it will need it will have some kind of a plan as to when it hits the obstacle what to do that is the behavior okay in this case it is very simple go left or go right okay so the earliest ideas of bug algorithms came from this uh, uh, motion of bugs and insects now let's come to mobile robots which we'll be dealing with so working with mobile robots uh, having differential drives now this is a differential drive mobile robot so you see that there are two wheels and there are motors there and these motors are independently actuating the two wheels okay and there is a caster wheel in front so there is a caster wheel in front which is providing support so this is similar to our uh, figure which we showed some time back that there are two wheels and there is a caster wheel here so this is omega 1 omega 2 and it basically moves by controlling omega 1 and omega 2 in front there is an ultrasonic sensor okay now this ultrasonic sensor basically can check for uh, depth or distance so if there is something in front it can sense that there is something in front and it can enforce some kind of a behavior for example go left go right okay or if there is something in front just stop now this is controlled by a, in this particular case by a uh, arduino microcontroller so the behavior of this will be a program okay which will be written in the form of a program and the behavior is going to be embedded in a program okay so these are the elements is a program so the program is the one that is going to actually determine what the robot is going to do so the program is the one that will find the path so in path planning our essential fun uh, function is to write a program or an algorithm that will enforce some kind of a behavior or a plan okay so you might have been familiar with this kind of robots which a lot of students make in high school these days and they are available in supermarkets. So we can do motion planning, path planning with this type of very very simple robots. Now uh, this shows the internal details of the mobile robot. So it has uh, uh, DC motors which are driving it and uh, in, in the previous one there was an ultrasonic sensor which is sensing uh, if there is an obstacle in front. In this one there is an IR sensor there. So IR stands for infrared infrared uh, sensors so this also can check it can check for color so for example this is using uh, if you're following a line for line following kind of robots okay so if you draw a line like this say for example i have a black line and i leave the robot on this black line so what it can do this infrared sensors can sense okay where is the uh, the black line say for example these are three infrared sensors okay so you can have a logic to ensure that two of the central infrared sensor will always remain on the line. So the moment two of this comes uh, out, it immediately understands that it has gone left. So it has to actuate the wheels to go right. So that's the behavior of the robot now. Okay. So this is just to give you an idea of what the path plan actually does or what is our objective here. So there are different kind of sensors, there are actuators for the robot and we can enforce different kind of uh, behavior of the robot. Now very quickly looking at the ultrasonic sensor. So ultrasonic sensor basically works on the uh, uh, has a ceramic transducer inside here, which is basically a piezo. So piezo crystal, as you know, that if you give pressure, it will produce charge, and if you give it charge, it will produce uh, it is going to expand. Okay, so it will expand here. So what is done is that this piezo crystal is actuated at a particular frequency. Now this is uh, shown here. So the piezo crystal is being actuated at a particular frequency, and it is vibrating at the so this piezo crystal pi crystal is uh, getting actuated at a particular frequency and this is the ultrasonic frequency okay so because it is vibrating at that frequency it is going to give out an ultrasonic wave so the ultrasonic wave goes out from the front like this okay so this is an ultrasonic wave now the moment there is something in front it will hit the uh, object and then it will come back now once it comes back it causes a pressure on the crystal and that pressure produces a charge. So depending on how much time it took to go and come back, you can compute, you know the uh, velocity of sound in air, so you know exactly how much time, what is the distance of the object from the sensor. 
So this is the out signal. This is the in signal. So this is my in signal. So the distance from here to here is my delta T, the time that it took to go and come back. So now you know what is the distance of the object. So these are ultrasonic sensors which are very simple and they are extensively used in mobile robots to check if there is some object in front to avoid obstacles. Infrared sensors, again, they can also sense uh, reflective surfaces. Okay. Now in an infrared sensor, there is an emitter. You can see there is an LED there which is emitting light and there is a photodiode which is a receiver. So this LED gives off light and the reflective surface reflects this light, IR infrared rays and it comes back and gets uh, received here. So exactly here also, it can exactly figure out color of an object or reflective surface in front. Okay. So IR sensors can also be used in mobile robots extensively. Now you can see ultrasonic sensors and IR are non-contact type, they don't touch. Okay. From far they can make out. So the robot can take can enforce a behavior simply when it gets the signal input. So if, it, if the program receives the signal that there is something in front, so it can immediately change its behavior. Okay, it can try and avoid the obstacle. The other kind of sensors are the sensors which are contact sensors, like the one that you looked at with the with the cockroach. Okay, so we looked at so in the case of the cockroach, we saw that uh, so there is a stylus in front. So this stylus is there. The stylus is there for touching. Okay, it is very very sensitive. It not only it can sense not only obstacles, it can sense if there is food, if there is uh, chemicals, it can sense. It's like our tongue basically. And uh, with this, it can sense if there is an object in front and then enforce its behavior. So in this particular case, it has to physically touch the object in this uh, robot where you can see that this is a stylus. Okay, so it's a stylus and if there is an object it is touching, what will happen is the stylus will bend. Okay. So, if it was not touch, touching, it would be straight like this. Now, because it is touching, what is happening is that uh, it is getting bent and there is an angle there. So, if there is a sensor here, we can use a potentiometer or an encoder, which will actually sense that the, the stylus is touching something. Why? Because it has bent. So, basically, you are looking at that angle alpha. Uh, sorry, this angle theta. Okay. So, basically, if it was not touching, it will be straight. Okay. And if it is touching something, it will immediately bend. So if it's touching something, it'll become like that. It's touching. So basically, this uh, this is being sensed, okay. And based on that, we know that there is something in front. This is also a very simple sensor for a robot to make, and a robots use this kind of sensors for touch the wall and follow the wall, follow the object, etc. The other is a tactile sensor, which is actually sensing the pressure. Okay. So there are different kinds of uh, uh, touch sensors or tactile sensors. So this one is a capacitive array. So if you touch, if this touches something, immediately what happens is there is a, a plus minus on top. So it is a grating like uh, on this side there are gratings like this. The bottom side there are gratings like this. So if it touches, what will happen is, oh let me explain it like this. If it touches, what will happen? There is a plus and a minus. So there is one on top and there is one at the bottom. So it's something like this. Okay, and there is a plus on top. So this is plus, that's minus. So if you press it, what will happen? This will get shorted. The moment it gets shorted. Uh, it is uh, something like a key on keyboard. As soon as this is pressed, that part is shorted and it gets a signal. So the robot understands there is something in front. This is another kind pressure sensor where if you touch, this is a resistive pressure sensor. So there is a change in resistance. So it immediately understands that it has touched. Okay, this is something like our strain gauge. So these are contact type. The earlier ones we have seen are non-contact type, IR and uh, ultrasonic sensor. Now, depending on the kind of sensor we have, the kind of range of the sensor, okay, we will have to enforce different kind of plans. Now, uh, let's move on further and now come here to the bug algorithm. Now, what is the object of the bug algorithm? What is the objective of the uh, bug algorithm? The objective is to find a path, so objective, find a path. from initial point to goal point okay so this this is shown in the figure here so i'm marking my x axis and my y axis and uh, this is my start point this is start okay we call it start and that's my goal and these are obstacles now a couple of uh, simplifications we make or assumptions we make 
The first is that the robot is a point robot. It has no physical dimension. Okay. So we are considering this robot to be a point robot. Next is it has a touch sensor to detect the contact with the obstacle. So the moment it makes contact with any obstacle, it knows that contact has been made. Okay. Now what is the objective? The objective is to find a path from the start point to the goal point. Okay. Avoiding the obstacles. Okay. Yeah, well, not avoiding the obstacle. It is touching the obstacle, not going through the obstacles. Okay. So the objective is to find a uh, path from the initial point to goal point. Okay. What is the plan that we are going to enforce? Okay. The plan that or the behavior that we are going to enforce is that it will have a motion to goal behavior and it has a boundary falling behavior. Okay. Now, what is the start of the algorithm? Now, something to note here is that if I asked you which is the path, you can simply tell me that go like this, go like this, or rather don't go like that, go like this, go like this, go like this, go like this. Okay. Now, we have eyes. So, you can see there is an obstacle there and the goal is there. The poor robot doesn't have eyes and it is in 2D, flat ground. Okay. So, for us it is very easy to say where is the path. For a robot, for a program to find out, it is not that easy. Okay. So, the program has to be written such that it can take the robot from the start point to the goal point okay, and it cannot go through the obstacle of course. The assumptions we have made, the robot is a point robot, it has a touch sensor to detect contact with obstacles so that it does not try and go, it cannot go through the obstacle and the input to the algorithm or the program is the start point, goal point and obstacles. Okay. So we have to write a program which will take the robot from the start point to the goal point okay and uh, not through the obstacle it cannot go through the obstacle okay now what is the behavior that we are going to enforce or the program is going to enforce or the plan that is going to be enforced now the first thing we can see is that uh, the robot should move towards the goal right always so if the robot starts going this side then it's going away from the goal it's not solving anything okay so uh, the first thing is motion to goal behavior so the robot should have a motion towards the goal behavior. Okay. The second is it should be boundary following. Boundary following or rather obstacle boundary following. Because it cannot go, go through the obstacle, it cannot do that. So it should be able to follow the boundary or the contour of the obstacle. Okay. That is the uh, essential uh, plan for the bu uh, bug algorithm. So what are we given? We are given start point, end point, uh, sorry, goal point and the obstacle. Now the program has to enforce number one motion to goal and boundary following. Let's see how that is done. So here we have, uh, so in the first uh, algorithm we have to reach a goal point from a start point avoiding the obstacles. Right. So this is the problem that uh, we are looking at here now. Okay. Now the robot is a point robot and it has a touch sensor. Okay. So now we are supposed to write a program which will actually do a perform or execute this motion now. The first algorithm that we will look at is the bug algorithm or the bug one algorithm. So there are different ways by which you can solve this problem. Okay. Let us see how we can think of uh, solving this problem uh, logically. Okay. So we have uh, one here and we have another one there. Okay. Obstacles. So these are obstacles. One obstacle 2. Okay. Let us call this my goal point. This is my start point. This is my start point. Okay. Now, the first thing is that it should have goal following behavior. This is something we have seen. So, number 1 is that goal seeking behavior. That means it should always try to go towards the goal because I want to go towards the goal. Right. It should go in some other direction. So the first thing that we can do is we can connect the goal with a straight line. Okay, so we connect the goal with a straight line like this. Okay, now if there were no obstacles, it will probably follow the straight line and go there. Now, because there are obstacles, it what it does is it follows the straight line until it comes to the hit point. Okay, so we call this Q1 H. Q1H is the hit point on obstacle. So Q is the hit, Q1H is the first hit point of the obstacle. Okay. So we are writing a program where the robot is going towards the goal. You know the direction of the goal, it has been given. Now as it is going, 
uh, as we connected with the, the start point and the goal point with the straight line, we follow the straight line. The moment it hits an obstacle, we know that it has hit. It has touch sensor, so it knows it has hit. Now what it does is it circumnavigates the obstacle. Okay. So basically it goes around like this, like this, all around the obstacle. So it explores the obstacle and comes back here. Okay. So it explores the obstacle and then comes back there. Okay. Now, once it has explored the obstacle, now it knows that uh, this is the shape of the obstacle. Okay. The mobile robot has actually found out. Now, what it does next is it follows the, I'll just change the color here. So this is next. What it does is it knows this is by Q1H now and it identifies the Q1L now, the Q1 leaf point. So the Q1 leaf is the next point which is uh, here. I'll just draw it again. So it did that, came back here. So now it identifies the Q1 leaf point which is here. So Q, so my initial straight line point was like this. Okay. So now what it does is it identifies the Q1 leaf. Q1 leaf, Q1 L stands the leaf, uh, the leaf point on this uh, circumference of the of, uh, on the of the obstacle. Okay. Now that Q1 leaf point is the nearest to the goal or the next obstacle. So whichever point where point is nearest to the goal or it is nearest to the next obstacle, that is the Q1 L point. And from the new uh, Q1 L point again, it will continue. So how it will continue? The same thing it will do. It will do like this and then go here. Okay. The moment it has gone there, what it will do? It will circumnavigate once like this and come back here. Now it has seen the full obstacle. Now after it has seen the full obstacle, what it will do is this is my Q2 hit point. Then it will identify the point which is nearest to the goal. This is the point which is, so this is QL2, the Q2 leaf point. Okay. So this is the Q2L point. Okay. So now it has come here and now it goes here. So what it is doing is it is going like this, it is circumnavigating once, coming back to this point, then it is finding the leaf point which is nearest to the next obstacle or to the goal, okay, and then it is finding the path which is nearest to the next obstacle, it is circumnavigating again, full round like this, coming here, finding the point, the leaf point and then it is going there and getting the goal. This is having goal seeking behavior, that is one, number two is it can circumnavigate the uh, obstacle. Okay, so goal point and circum. Now, as I said before, this is a point, robot is a point and it has no eyes, so it can see. It is simply, it's a program which is going to execute this motion. It will always go towards the goal and if it hits an obstacle, circumnavigate, find the leaf point which is nearest to the next obstacle or the goal and then uh, go to the obstacle, circumnavigate and then go to the goal in this case. Now, this search is an exhaustive search and it is not fast. Why? Because it is circumnavigating each time. So, if there is a long obstacle, you can imagine it will keep going all around the obstacle. Where it actually doesn't have to go do that. So, for example, if the goal was somewhere here, okay, so that was my goal. Then it, for nothing, it will just be going round and round the obstacle and then it will come here, then find the leaf point and then go there. So, but this is an exhaustive search, which means that it has looked at all the possibilities. This is the earliest algorithm called the bug algorithm. Now you can write a very simple program which can do that because a point has coordinates x, y and uh, when it is touching you know that you know the uh, the circumference of this obstacle, right? So whenever x, y is hitting or touching that circumference you can find out geometrically. So you know it has touched. Now you know the shape of the object so you can circumnavigate very easily. You can find the uh, q1 l point then go to the next obstacle. So this has to be done geometrically, okay? So path planning is a geometrical problem. Okay, so let's what does the algorithm look like? So start with uh, QL0, which is the start point. Okay, and then uh, the first thing is from QL, QL1 move towards to the goal point. Okay, until goal is reached or obstacle encountered at Q1 hit. So this is what we did. So you start off from the start point, go towards the obstacle. If you hit an object, okay, that is your hit point Q1H. Okay, follow the obstacle boundary by moving left or right. Now, please note here that it is left or right. You can't do both. Okay, you cannot go left and right at the same time. And then until Q goal is reached or Q1H is re-encountered. Determine the point QLL, leaf point on the perimeter, that is the shortest distance to the goal. 
go to ql1 and then move forward if you reach the goal then exit okay exit with if move towards q goal moves into obstacles then exit with failure okay so this basically means that uh, we are going to go to this obstacle circumnavigate find the leap point go to the next and then uh, proceed that way okay failure cases of this will it always work well if there are objects which are enclosed objects like this okay this we can understand very easily that if you have an obstacle like this and uh, you can see that you have a start point here and you have a goal point there so what will happen is it will this algorithm will the algorithm will function right because uh, it cannot see it cannot see that the obstacle is enclosed so it will first make a straight line then follow the straight line get a hit hit point so this is q1 hit circumnavigate like this come back here okay try to find the nearest point to the obstacle and it, it cannot do that so this will end in failure okay so in this uh, the algorithm will start by going towards the goal it will hit the boundary it will circumnavigate come back here try and find a point a leaf point but uh, q1 the q1l does not exist okay because it cannot go out there is to the uh, to the outer boundary there is no connection and there is no way it can go to the goal so this will be a failure uh, case okay so it should be able to say that there is no path next is uh, uh, so when you look at this whenever we look at uh, path planning algorithms like this okay the thing that comes to my, your mind is is there a better way of doing this okay is there a faster way so the faster way of doing this is the next one which is called bug 2 now in bug 2 what we have seen in the previous case is there is uh, no need to really go round the obstacle all the time so for example if i had an obstacle like this and the goal was here and the start was here then what it would do is it will come here then go around like that and then go here and then go here and then go there so that's a bad way of doing things okay well it's not a bad way of doing things but that is one way of doing things but the other way could be that you connect this with a straight line and follow the straight line if you hit the obstacle go around the obstacle wherever you are getting the straight line you follow the straight line and then go to the goal so i put a straight line like this so from here i go here hit I go like this, hit the straight line again, and then I go there. I don't circumnavigate. Okay, so this is showing uh, the path, which is uh, the bug algorithm two. So what we do here is we connect the goal and the start point with the M line, if and and follow the M line. So you can see that it is following the M line like this. So it has gone. The moment it hits, so Q1H, it'll go left like this until it finds the line again. Once it finds the line again, this one becomes Q1 leave. It goes there, it becomes Q2 hit. Okay. And from Q2 hit, it circumnavigate, it goes on the left side like this and gets that and goes there. Okay. This was much faster because it did not circumnavigate. Okay. So this is bug 2 algorithm uh, where we follow a line which is called the M line. The moment you hit the obstacle, you circumnavigate until you hit the line. The moment you get the line, you follow the line. Don't follow the obstacle. Okay, and then go to the obstacle. Once you hit the obstacle again, then go to the uh, find the line again, and then go to the go to the goal point. Okay. Now this is uh, faster. Now you can see in this particular case also from the start point to the goal point, connect with a straight line, follow the straight line, come like this, follow the uh, obstacle boundary, come like this, hit the point, and go to the goal. Okay. Now this is the bug algorithm two, the program. Okay, the logic. So in all the when you're writing a program okay there is a plan okay and there is some kind of a logic uh, logic let, let me call it a logical plan we start with q1l okay so q1l moves towards the goal along the m line so we fix an m line first and then from the first leaf point which is the start point so this is my start point it goes to the goal point following the m line the moment it hits an obstacle okay if goal is reached exit now if goal is not reached then follow the boundary move left or right okay left or right you have to choose one you can't do both so go left or right until you hit the m line again the moment you hit the m line follow the m line again until you reach the goal or you reach the boundary and then follow the boundary again hit the m line and then go to the goal point okay this is basically 
the bug algorithm 1 and bug algorithm 2. Now, bug algorithm 1 is an exhaustive search. Okay, it is more complete. It is more complete in the sense that it can find all possible paths. In that sense, it is more complete. Okay, so if there is more than one path, it can find multiple paths. Now, bug 2 is what we call a greedy search algorithm in the sense that uh, it is an opportunistic search. Okay, and it's a greedy search because it tries to find the solution faster. Okay, and it is faster as you saw in the previous case. So the question comes, which is better, bug 1 or bug 2? Now, in path planning, you'll always see that this question comes up. Is there a better algorithm? Is this better than that? Okay. Now, it would depend on the situation or case to case, it depends. Okay. So, it would just appear to us that bug 2 is better, but you'll find that uh, that is not so. It depends on the situation now. So, let's look at this now. So, in this particular case, comparison of bug 1 and bug 2, the obstacle shape in which bug 2 does better than bug 1. In this particular case, as shown on the left, Okay, so what we are given is the goal here and we are given a start here. So it goes straight, gets the M line. So let me draw the M line. It follows the M line, hits the obstacle, circumnavigates, hits the M line again, again then goes like this, like this and then goes to the goal. So this is faster. Okay, whereas if I was doing this with the bug 1 algorithm, then what it will do is bug 1 will go here, then it will go circumnavigate like this. Okay, then it will go back here. It will go there, then it will circumnavigate everything here, then go here, then go there. Okay. So, bug, uh, bug 1 is the green line and uh, bug 2 is the blue line. So, we can see in this particular case that bug 2 is faster. Okay. What about here? Now, in this kind of a situation, we want to go from here to here. There, that's my straight line. Okay. Let me follow the straight line and see what happens. Okay, so I'm following the straight line and let us see what happens here. So I go straight like this, I hit the uh, I hit the obstacle. Now I go like this, I go like this, I go like this, I go like this, like this, like this, I hit the obstacle. Okay. Now I can come back like this, like this, and come back here again. That is one option. Okay. The other is I have my straight line like this. Okay, remember you can go left or right only, you can't do both. So here what we do is, it, it follows the line straight, then it goes left like this, it goes here, 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 it hits the line, it hits the line again, comes like this, come like this, come like this, like this, like this, and it's back here again. So it appears that it has got trapped in somewhere. So in this particular case, bug 1 will beat bug 2. So if you look at bug 1, what will happen in bug 1 is it is going to circumnavigate all of this and then find the path from here and then find the shorter spot. Okay. So, in case of bug 1, what it is going to do is it will go from here, it gets that, then it starts circumnavigating like this, okay, because it is finding the full shape of the obstacle, then it is coming like this, circumnavigating. Now, it exactly knows which is the point where it is the, the leaf point which is closest to the obstacle, so it will come here and then go there, okay. So, in this particular case, bug 1 will beat bug 2. So, you can see that this path planning problem is very much specific to the problem that is being at or the shape of the obstacles because this is geometry. So, it is very much very uh, related to the geometry of the problem. Again, this is another case of comparison of uh, bug 1 and bug 2. Okay. So, in this particular case, we have a start point. Uh, we have a start point and we have a goal point which is inside. So, this is my goal point. Okay. So, this is bug 1 and that's bug 2. Okay. Now, uh, we can see that uh, uh, this is my start point, you can start here. So, bug 1, what will it do? It will go, it will first draw the straight line like this. Okay. Then it will start going straight, then it will circumnavigate like this, like this, like this and then come back here. Okay. Now, it knows because it has seen the full circumference or the uh, exterior boundary of the spiral, now it can find the leaf point which is nearest to the goal point, right. So, it will go till here and if this is my, uh, if this is my goal, okay, then it will go here and then it will reach the goal from there, okay. So, in this particular case, so where was my goal, my goal was, uh, yeah, so 
after it circumnavigates once, what will happen is it will go like this, like this, like this, like this, like this. Come back here. Next, it has to find which point is nearest to the goal. So it finds that this point is nearest to the goal. So it simply goes there. Okay, so it follows this, goes here, and then simply goes to that goal. So next shot, what it will do is it will come like this, 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 and then go to the goal. It knows what is the leaf point. So this is my Q1 hit, and this is my Q1 leave. But let's see in the case of what happens here. So this is my start, and that's my goal here. Okay. Now let's see back to what it does. It, it generates a straight line first. Then what it does is it uh, goes like this. Uh, okay, it goes from the right side like this here, 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 here. Okay, then it finds the line goes this side. Now it comes down like this, and now what happens is it comes back here again. Now back to has got trapped. You can see that. So in this case also, in the case of a spiral, uh, back to loses and back to bug one wins. So you can see that it is very much dependent on the profile. Now the point robot now has an ultrasonic rain sensor okay so we are still with the bug algorithm but uh, the robot in the previous case has a touch sensor okay but in this case it has an ultrasonic rain sensor so it can sense the distance distance to object okay so the rain sensor has a finite range of detection and it can sweep 360 degrees so if this is my sensor ultrasonic sensor it can rotate 360 degrees if this is my zero degrees it can rotate like this full 360 degrees and it can so these are the rays ultrasonic rays which are coming out and can sense distance so if there's an obstacle like this it can sense that there is an obstacle in front okay the rain sensor will prevent the robot from colliding with the obstacle okay now you can see here that there are two very one is the dist the position of the robot x okay and the angle at which it was sweeping which is uh, uh, which is the sweep angle okay at which it was uh, so we can call it theta so this is my angle theta okay so what we need to do here is we need to define a range uh, we need to define a distance function okay which consists of the position where the robot is and what is the sweep angle of the ultrasonic sensor okay so we define a distance function to find the shape of the obstacle because the shape of the obstacle let me draw the obstacle having some of the shape is uh, the ultrasonic sensor is uh, okay. so at different distance it has different distances at different angles so the robot x is the same x but at different angles at different thetas you can see that the distance that it is getting of the obstacle is different. Why? Because the obstacle has a particular shape. So basically this rho is what is going to give us the distance function. Okay. So for the same x for a different theta it will give you a different distance and the distance function is defined as rho x theta where x is the coordinate of the robot. And uh, the coordinate of the robot center and theta is the angle of sweep okay, of the sensor okay so this we are seeing that we are using ultrasonic sensor now now depending on the range of the sensor and what is the sweep angle of the sensor you will get a different distance reading now okay depending on the shape of the object now so next let's look at uh, our raw distance function that we are getting now what is the objective here uh, the objective here is that we need to find out what is the shape of the obstacle. Okay, so we are using this uh, range sensor which is going to give us the shape of the obstacle now. So this is my x, let's imagine this is my x, and theta is going to vary from 0 to 360 degrees, one sweep. And this is the shape of the obstacle that we are getting. Now the shape of the obstacle basically is a function of the distance now. Okay. The distance I mean the, this ray, the length of the ray if I say. Okay. So this is what is giving me the shape of the obstacle now. Okay. And that is my rho x theta. Okay. There is obstacles here. These are called uh, W0401, O2, O3, O4 are called obstacles. And the moment it hits an obstacle, you will get some value for that. 
Okay, that means that it has some distance. Okay, what is the distance from the sensor to that obstacle? That is what is my rho. So, rho is the distance from sensor to obstacle. Okay, and if there is no obstacle, then it will become infinity, of course. This will go in towards infinity. That means nothing is there in front. Okay. So, basically, we are looking at this uh, distance function rho and then trying to decide the, the shape of the obstacles. Okay. Today, we looked at trying to find out the, the, uh, the use of bug algorithms, which is based on how bugs move uh, in the real world. Okay. And uh, we also saw that the bugs have locomotion and they have some kind of uh, uh, sensor, for example, touch sensors or they can have vision. Okay. Cor correspondingly, in the robot, we have robot which moves around with wheels and the robot has some kind of sensors. So, it can have touch sensor or it can have uh, or it can have ultrasonic sensors, distance sensors. Now, we stopped at the condition where we are using a mobile robot which is having an ultrasonic sensor and to check the distance, it basically looks at the how far the object is and it derives a function, okay, which is uh, or the distance. Uh, or what we call the distance function is a function of the sweep angle and the position of the robot. So, today we will stop here in the next class we will uh, continue from here and look at how to figure out the shape of the object and then how to plan your path from the where the robot is to the goal point and we will see that it depends on the range of the sensor also. So, we will stop here. Thank you.